and I live. Is that better? There we go. Uh, come back each night uh, for BBS starting at 6.30. Uh, Jeff will share more information about that uh, later uh, after the service. A couple of announcements, uh, well, birthdays for this week. Kylie and Lily Crow on the 11th. Uh, Best to Mumbrium on the 13th. Lanai Thurman on the 14th. Melissa Bishop on the 15th. Anna Whitaker and Harper Haynes on the 6th, 16th, and Shelby Loveless on the 17th. And also happy anniversary on the 16th to Carol and Barbara Cagle. Uh, for those that, uh, that haven't seen the announcement on the, uh, in the uh, bulletin, uh, Austin, who's leading singing today, is getting married next week. A uh, big, big week for us, and actually this is his last Sunday to be with us here worshiping. Uh, they will be moving to northwest Arkansas, so we spent the last three days uh, driving up there, moving them in, and then driving back. Uh, it was a really exciting time, but uh, we're going to miss him here at this congregation, but know that he will use his talents uh, uh, in a congregation there in Arkansas, and so just ask you to pray for them as they make this move, and... Um, and start a new life. And I know we have several, uh, several of our young people getting married this year, and it's an exciting time. And some that are that are having babies. And just just keep all these uh, young people in your prayers. Uh, it's a you know it's a difficult time right now, and there's a lot of things that pull at them. And just pray that they stay uh, strong in the Lord. Uh, as you, if you look in the bulletin, also there is some information on our speaker for this week and this morning. Uh, Gary Hill is uh, going to be speaking on archaeology and the Bible. Uh, it sounds a very interesting lesson, so hopefully uh, everybody can come back. All the adults will be here for class each night of VBS. I think it will be very exciting. Uh, we will be uh, recording those, live streaming everything, uh, so you can watch online as well or catch up uh, later uh, if you miss something uh, live. So with that, uh, we'll begin our worship service uh, in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today thankful for this time to be together as a church family and, and worship together and worship you. And we're thankful for all those that have put so much work into our Vacation Bible School and that it'll be a success and that uh, we'll be able to teach your word to the children and, and to the adults and that we'll grow. Lord, we continue to pray as, as we try to spread your word in this community that uh, others will be brought to your kingdom. Lord, we're thankful for all of our ministers, our youth directors, those that work with our young children, and just ask you to continue to bless them, uh, bless everyone here. Lord, we're mindful of those that, that may be sick, that cannot attend, and that you'll comfort them, be with, be with doctors that are they're working to heal them. Lord, we're also mindful of, of those that, uh, that may have lost loved ones, uh, that you'll comfort them in, in these difficult times. Lord, we ask your blessings also on, on Austin and Kayla as they begin their life together next week and for, for others that are getting married this year uh, or having, having their first child or uh, just ask you to bless them and help them to continue strong in the faith. Ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
If you're able this morning, let's all stand for our first two songs this morning. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the dark.
Tidak. This is holy ground. We're standing on Supper packet. If you did not receive one or get one, if you'll raise your hand, we have some people here that will give you. As we focus our minds and thoughts on what Jesus did for us and continues to do for us, I want to read what Paul writes to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Let's pray for the bread. Father God, we come to you at this time as we're mindful of King Jesus and what he came and what he gave up so that what we can possess and have is truly amazing grace. It's, it's, it's your rich blessings and mercy beyond our comprehension and as we are here together in this building as your local church body of believers, I pray that as we partake of the bread, we're mindful of, of the one who came down to earth in the form of a bondservant, who humbled himself, and that we can have the same like-mindedness as he possessed and showed and demonstrate as we partake of this in a worthy manner. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's go back to our Heavenly Father in prayer and for the cup. Most graciously, Heavenly Father, we come to you again as we remember the second emblem of the supper that our Lord instituted in that upper room, the fruit of the vine, the, the, the cup that represents the blood, the blood that was shed, but the blood that also saves, the power that's in the blood. As we drink of this, may we be mindful of what it symbolizes and the focus on you and what you have done for us and what it continuously does for us as it cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We are grateful and thankful for it. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Apart from the Lord's Supper, we, out of convenience, take up a collection as it's told to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, laying aside the things that we have prospered. I thought about this morning, the rain, waking up with the rain and seeing the rain and how what a blessing that is for us here in Middle Tennessee and we needed it as a land. But I think about how God gives graciously and bountifully and we have an opportunity to to work and to make a living and to provide for our family and also to to contribute to the work here at the local church and through the various things that our elders have set aside. So let's thank God for the blessings that we do have and for the opportunity to give back. Bow with me. Father God, we again we come to you at this time. We are so grateful for the just just every little blessing that you you give us and we we are so just um, just unbelievably uh, just uh, amazed by just just so many things in our life that we, we could just overlook so easily that you bless us and, and, and show to us and shower us with with your grace and mercy we're so thankful that for us to have the ability to get up and to provide a living and to to have a roof over our house and clothes and food and in fact, we have more than what we need, and we're, we're, we're truly blessed. We're grateful for this opportunity to, to, to contribute, uh, to give back in a way to further the work of your kingdom. As our, our elders here are with wisdom, be with them as they uh, distribute and give to the work that is so needed as we find here at Charlotte Heights, and we're so thankful. Thankful for each person who, who gives and thankful for each person that contributes the way that they do. We're truly blessed and we just ask that you'll bless this effort and continue to be with us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Proof for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You may be seated.
And good morning, everyone. I am so, so happy to be here with you good brethren. Uh, this morning, I was very, very excited to get the invitation to come and speak on one of my favorite subjects, uh, and that is archaeology in the Bible. And I am just amazed at all the tremendous work that has gone into getting ready for this vacation Bible school. I uh, felt felt like I was in a museum. I felt like I was in a Bible land museum when I walked in the door, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you and be with you all week long. Looking forward to us studying a very important topic, a very important topic in today's world. You know, there's a lot of people out there, folks, that don't believe in the historicity of the Bible. A lot of people attack the scriptures. A lot of uh, uh, students in schools are taught such things as the Bible is full of myths and it was so old, written 2,000 plus years ago, that it can't be true. And the really scary part of all of that, beloved, is the fact that a lot of people feel like the Bible is not relevant for us as we live today. But we have just heard in our hearing one of the most amazing passages of Scripture. And that tells us that all Scripture is inspired of God. Let's open our Bibles back again to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. But we're going to back up a couple of verses before in the text. And Paul is writing to the young man Timothy here. And he's telling him something very important as he's preaching at Ephesus. He says in verse 15, How from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. You know, Vacation Bible School is a time for children, isn't it? It's a time to acquaint our children and also us as adults to be reminded of the sacred writings. Why are the sacred writings so important to us as Christians? He says, Timothy, from a childhood, you've been acquainted with these sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation. That's why the scripture is important. How are people going to know God's will for their life? How are people going to know what they need to do to be saved? How can salvation come about? Well, it comes about through our study, our belief, our reverence, and our learning the sacred scripture. Because all scripture is breathed out, is inspired of God, and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man or child of God may be thoroughly furnished into every good work. Well, archaeology, ancient history and archaeology, uh, see if I could get this to turn right, yeah, is a very important part that we can use, a very important science that we can use, a very important uh, illustration that we can use to give us confidence in the scripture. And again, like we said at the very beginning, there's a lot of folks out there that don't believe in the relevance of the Bible anymore. Or they think the Bible is just one of many holy books. Um, I teach at the National School of Preaching and Biblical Studies, and I teach a class called Islam versus the Bible. And you know, one of the things about all world religions is they have their holy books. They have their books that they follow and they believe are true and come from their God. But we as Christians know that all Scripture is inspired of God. So how are we going to tell others? And how are we going to illustrate? And how are we going to really, really reach those who are seekers in today's world? Well, archaeology is important to us. And that's what we're, I'm going to be teaching in the adult class all week. It's important to the study of the Bible because the scriptures tell us about real people. These are not fictional characters. These are not comic book characters or something like that. They're real people and they lived in real places and they participated in real events. 
Let me introduce myself here. I've uh, been studying history and archaeology for many years, and I've been on numerous digs, not only here in the States, that's how I learned to be an archaeologist, I uh, did Native American digs, but I was invited starting in 1996 to start excavating in Israel. And I've been to Israel numerous times, and every time I've been there, I come away with a greater faith, a greater vividness, a greater illustrations of the importance of Scripture, and that it tells us about real people, real places, and real events. That's why archaeology is important. And it supports the biblical account of people, places, and events. As a matter of fact, documents outside of the Bible confirm the biblical accounts. Did you know over 50 people, and there's even been three found this summer, 50 different people that are mentioned in the Bible, not mentioned anywhere else, have been discovered by archaeologists and inscriptions and in tomb paintings and in uh, clay tablets. Over 50 people named in the Old Testament have been found outside the biblical text, thus showing they were real people. The recovery of century upon century of lost human history through archaeological exploration, excavation, and decipherment over the past 200 years, y'all, is one of the most astonishing achievements in the modern age. And no wonder. Because again, as we begin the lesson this morning, with the scripture reading, the Bible is inspired. As a matter of fact, David said in the 119th Psalm, Thy word is allotted to my feet and allotted to my path. I have sworn and I have confirmed, he says, that I will keep your righteous judgments. So how can we trust those righteous judgments? How can we trust the teachings of the Bible? Well, archaeology comes to the rescue. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, some skeptics will tell you that the Bible does not claim to be inspired. That's just something you Christians came up with. But that's not true. As a matter of fact, if you read carefully through the Old Testament, there are over 3,800 claims of inspiration in the Old Testament alone. 3,800 times the writers of the Old Testament said, we are writing as men of God. And of course, Jesus promised his disciples and promises us today that the New Testament would be inspired would come from God. He said in John chapter 14, in the last week of his life, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring your remembrance of all things that I have said unto you. So God's word is truth. God's word is truth. And one of our great clarion calls one of our great challenges, one of our great works as members of the body of Christ, being the salt and the light to our community and to our world, is to proclaim that we must listen to God's Word. It's truth. It came from God Himself. As a matter of fact, when Paul established the church at Thessalonica and then later wrote back to those wonderful Christians, here's what he says to them. He says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, the inspired early preachers of the New Testament, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectively works in you who believe. You know, the more we believe and the more we have trust in and the more we meditate upon and the more we focus upon the Scripture, the more we are letting God work through our lives. That's why this Vacation Bible School, that's why the church services and all the good works this congregation and congregations around the world are doing is so very important. How are we going to effectively be Christians? How are we going to effectively change our world that all of us would realize and recognize we need to change? The world does need changing, doesn't it? And the only way it can be changed is through our reverence, our obedience, our understanding, 
and our believing in Scripture. As a matter of fact, we've already talked about what the Bible says about itself. There are also numerous external confirmations of the Bible being completely trustworthy. Because listen, if we can go to the Bible and we can find historical mistakes, scientific mistakes, writers contradicting one another all throughout, if we can find writers talking about things that are myth and untrue, then we wouldn't want to listen to this book, would we? Not in our scientific day and age. We wouldn't want to listen. Because if it's wrong in Genesis, then it's going to be wrong in Acts. If it's wrong in 1 Samuel, it's going to be wrong in 2 Corinthians. So we have to have confidence in the Scriptures. And as Christians, all of us, as we're doing this whole week in this wonderful Vacation Bible School, we're all learning to be detectives, aren't we? We're all learning to search and think about it and, and reference and, and explore. That's why it's so exciting to be a Christian, isn't it? It's exciting. Say amen. Amen. Right? It's exciting to be a Christian because we have the challenge, beloved, to explore these things we're talking about and come to a greater confidence ourselves and then share that good, wonderful news to the world. Archaeology is a great confirmation of the Bible's complete trustworthiness. Many sites have been unexplored. Every time I go to Israel, we get to travel on the weekends. That is really fun. We rent a little car. They don't have big cars in Israel. They have little bitty cars like Bugs. Remember Bugs? Anybody own a VW Bug? They have little, and they they all look like little bugs, and they have strange colors too. Like uh, the last time we were in Israel, we rode around in a little bright fuqua bug, and here we are exploring the Bible lands. I know we didn't feel real manly in it, but uh, we were exploring the Bible lands, and we're going to all of these different places. Well, every time we go somewhere, we always say the same thing. Man, we need to excavate there because there's mound after mound, hill after hill, cave after cave, mountain after mountain. It's never been excavated. As a matter of fact, archaeologists tell us only 20% of the country, the Bible lands, have been excavated. If you want to be an archaeologist, you've got your life's work ahead of you. You've got a lot to do because there's a lot of things. And just imagine, we're going to look at some things in just a second, y'all, that have been found that prove the trustworthiness of the Scripture. But just think of the things that may be found in the next few years. I teach a class at Nashville called New Discoveries in Biblical Archaeology. And when I first taught the class, I've taught it three different times because the director of the school says, Gary, can you teach it uh, every year? And I said, yes, of course, because every month in my research magazines, my Bible magazines and everything, they always talk about new discoveries. There's always stuff being found. Many sites have been unexplored, and we ask the question, therefore, in our Bible lesson this morning, what does this have to do with inspiration? Well, here it is, y'all. If we claim the Bible's inspired to the world, and that's our clarion call, that's our clarion message. The message is the inspired message of God in the Scripture. Archaeology serves to confirm the credibility of the individual writers of both the Old and the New Testament. It has discovered peoples, events, whole civilizations, which were known about only through the Bible. And skeptics had a field day 50, 60 years ago. They said there's no such thing as the Hittites, there's no such thing as King Sargon, there's no such, Luke was wrong when he talked about the rulers of the city at Thessalonica and all these other things. Uh, but guess what happened? Little diggers. And by the way, we're always looking to volunteers. If you want to volunteer before the end of the week, please give me your name and I will set you up, okay? We're always looking for diggers, all right? Diggers have gone out, schools have gone out, explorers have gone out and discovered every one of the skeptical things that have been said 
was simply not true. It's discovered people, civilizations, events that was only mentioned in the Bible. If the statements, here we go, and here's our purpose in our study. If the statements, y'all, of the Bible, which are capable of being checked or confirmed by archaeological evidence, any reasonable and fair-minded individual will be led to accept its total testimony. One man I want to give as an example is this man here. He's probably considered the dean of American archaeology. His name was William F. Albright, and he began his excavation. He was a professor at John Hopkins University. He began his excavation not really believing in the historicity of the Bible, especially the early Bible, the book of Genesis, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. But he went to Israel. He decided to test his beliefs. He went to Israel and he dug for many, many years, taught at the university, wrote books, and he came to the conclusion that the Bible is true. The Bible is historically accurate. Another man that we will look at just for a second is Nelson Gluck. Nelson Gluck was from Cincinnati and he was a famous archaeologist that dug in the country of Jordan. And he said the very famous quote, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever converted a biblical reference. In other words, there's nothing ever been found that showed the Bible to be false. In the Old Testament, a man named Jewel, Jewel Wellhausen years ago said in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 16 where it mentions camels, the Bible was wrong because there was no such thing as domesticated camels during the time of Abraham. But archaeology came to the rescue and time and time again it found huge burials in civilizations of domesticated camels. Abraham and Ur, we read in the scripture in Genesis 12 that God called Abraham out of his hometown Ur to go to Canaan. Okay, well, what was Ur like? We wonder, we wonder what it was like. Okay, Abraham, did you go from one desert place living in a tent to another desert place living in a tent? And the answer is no, no. Ur was a very modern city with apartments and running water. And Abraham's city has been excavated. And because of that, by this man, whoa, that's pretty cool. Uh, uh, wow. Uh, Abraham, anyway, Abraham, that city was excavated, y'all. And I had some great pictures for you, but uh, uh, it was all about, uh, it was all of, there we go. So Leonard Woolley, this man here, excavated her, and he found beautiful, beautiful city apartments, like I said, city streets, golden. Uh, Golden uh, icons, uh, this is a ram, a golden ram, and uh, that's Sir Leonard Woolley over on the side there on your slide. And uh, he illustrated for us, and this is an important point now, he illustrated for us how much faith Abraham really did have. What if you were told today, okay, you've got to leave here, you've got to leave your home, you've got to go live in the middle of nowhere, without car, without electricity, without, ooh, internet, ooh, that'd be horrible, wouldn't it? Without, without any of that, without any of the modern conveniences, and you had to, to, to live off the land, you had to kill your own food, or go fish, or whatever you needed to do, and that's how you had to live. Boy, it would take a lot of, lot of courage to do that, wouldn't it? Well, that's basically, we know, from the excavation of Ur, what went on with Abraham, okay? He was told to leave this beautiful modern uh, city and go live in a tent in the desert for the rest of his life. Uh, and ar so archaeology illustrates the Bible. This is Abraham's hometown appearing on the screen. It's been excavated and he worshiped, they worship false gods there. Abraham, though, uh, was our father of the faithful because he started worshiping the one true God, Yahweh. And this is a uh, temple to the moon goddess that they worshiped in his hometown. 
Also, another thing skeptics used to say, y'all, is that the Bible says Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In Exodus 17, 14, the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua. And in Exodus chapter 24 and verse 4, Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. A skeptic said, no, there was not writing during Moses' time. But guess what? Archaeology came to the rescue. Sir Flinders Petrie found writing in the Sinai Peninsula around 1500 B.C., so infidelity was shown to be wrong after all. This is some of the earliest form of writing. As a matter of fact, in my display out in the foyer, you will see some of the earliest form of writing called cuneiform. I have a cuneiform tablet, and people always ask me what it says, and I will tell you, okay? I will tell you what that tablet says later on if you go out there and see it. But archaeology showed the false worship that the Bible and the prophets and the men and women of God, faithful men and women of God, stood against. Archaeology showed that the Exodus really happened. This is me standing by a stele that was found in Egypt, which uh, talks about Israel already being in the land and uh, settled. King Sargon, I mentioned him a minute ago. In Isaiah 21, it mentions King Sargon, the Assyrian king, but there was no record of it. They had never found any record in the Assyrian archives. But archaeologist Paul Boda discovered the palace of Sargon, and here is Sargon right here. Again, infidelity was shown to be wrong. Again, Goliath has been found at Gath. Dr. Ariel Meir, a professor at Ben Alon University, a friend of ours as a matter of fact, was the director of the excavation that found the Goliath stone. Gath, of course, is where Goliath is from, and this is Gath. And uh, this is the inscription that mentions him, showing that he was a true person and uh, that lived during that time. And of course, one of the greatest archaeological finds found in the last 10 years is skeptics have said for the last 15 years, there's a famous book out, and uh, we'll mention that in another lesson. I'm going to do a whole lesson on King David and evidence for him. But uh, this lady, called, uh, her name is Iliot Mazar. She has found David's palace in Israel, and archaeologists are calling it the archaeological find of the century because the skeptics said David may have existed, he may have been a robber, Robin Hood, he may have lived with his band of merry men in the caves of Israel, but there's no way he had a kingdom, and there's no way, there's no way, he had a capital in Jerusalem and was a part of what the Bible calls, or what we call, but the Bible teaches concerning the United Monarchy. But we have found his palace. At Tel Dan, another place in Israel, his name has been mentioned as the uh, dynasty ruler of the Israelites. The name Hezekiah has been found. Again, further confirmation of the Bible being true. A clay seal with his name on it. And in the New Testament, it's the same thing. In Luke chapter 2, he mentions there Quirinius governing Syria. Well, skeptics said Quirinius never governed Syria. And if he did govern Syria, he certainly didn't do it during the time of our Lord's birth. But Caesar Augustus, Quirinius was governor two times, 4 B.C., the time of Jesus' birth, and 6 and 12 A.D. And in the inscription was found that showed this happened in Antioch of Pisidia. So again, let's conclude. We can look at some other things, and we will later on this week. But let's conclude by saying this this morning. We have, you can see, as I'm thumbing through these things, you can see that there's a lot of confirmation of the Bible. We can have full confidence in the story of Scripture. As a matter of fact, Sir William Ramsey was a skeptic when he started doing archaeology around the turn of the last century. 
And as he started doing archaeology, he was going to prove that what Luke wrote in the book of Acts concerning the Apostle Paul and his journeys were not true. He was going to prove that. He was honest with us. He said, I'm going to prove these are not true. I don't believe they're true at all. But as he continued to explore and follow Paul around, some 1,500 years later after Paul, he said this, I found myself brought into contact with the book of Acts as an authority for the topography, antiquities, and society of Asia Minor. It was gradually borne upon me that in various details the narrative showed marvelous truth. He became a believer, wrote a lot of books about apologetics and defending the historicity of the Bible because of his archaeological research. The Bible is inspired, y'all. We know that, but we have to tell people that and show people that. And archaeology is a great tool in helping us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And archaeology is a wonderful tool to show the biblical documents are characterized by a precision of accuracy that can only be explained in one way. The Bible is true. And we can have full confidence in that. We live in a world where there are some skeptics. We live in a world that people are very dismissive of Scripture, like we said at the beginning. They're very dismissive of the Bible. Christianity is one of many religions. Well, Jesus said differently here, didn't he? He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. Well, we have to have confidence in that. And I think we all do. But we also have to share that confidence. And there are a lot of ways we can have confidence in the Scripture as we read and study and meditate upon it. Archaeology is just one of many tools that we can use. But we are all on an expedition, y'all. We're all explorers. We're all adventurers. And we all have the opportunity to... to study these things, to learn these things, and to strengthen our faith, and to go out and share our faith with others. You may be here today and need to become a Christian. I can tell you this. Archaeology has shown the Bible was true. I know a lot of Christian believers, scientists, others who have full confidence in the Bible because of their work in the field. I know the Bible is true. I know Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And I know he says that we're to believe on him. We're to repent of our sins. As Peter preached the first sermon, he said, you guys were eyewitnesses of these things. And when he said you were eyewitnesses of these things and said that Jesus died and was resurrected by the power of God, And let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus, both Lord and Christ. The people cried out. And it wasn't just a meek crying out. I remember as a kid reading that scripture, even standing in front of the church and reading that scripture, Acts chapter 2, verse 36, and saying, and the people cried out. And Peter said, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the people cried out. Well, no, when he said that, it was a life changer. And they really cried out. What must we do? Because you have told us that there's only one way to God, and that's through Jesus. And of course, Peter's divinely inspired answer, because they had believed by then. Why had they believed? Because they had been taught the Word of God. The same Word that we have, beloved. They had been taught the Word of God, and he told them... Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. People are crying out today. People are searching. People need to know the truth. And it's our job as explorers, as adventurers, as Christian detectives to know these things and to share these things with others. The Bible is inspired. 
We can have confidence in it. And we can live our lives in that confidence, that hope, that peace, that joy that Jesus came to give. And if you're here this morning and need to join with God's people in obedience to the gospel, we're going to offer you God's invitation. And those of us as Christians, let us accept the adventure. Accept the exploration. And what a great vacation Bible school. What a great week we're going to have together, both young and old alike, learning things that will help us all have greater confidence in our faith and walk strong, walk bold, walk tall, and sharing the good news that God has blessed us with. So if you need to respond in any way, we encourage you to do so right now as we stand and as we sing. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need. this morning. Thank you so much for being here. If you're online with us, we appreciate that also. 
Austin, good job leading singing. We're going to miss you. Uh, I don't know what to say about Austin. He's, he's a great song leader, but uh, he, he, never, he, he never says no. You can ask him to do whatever, and uh, he will, he, he's so glad to do that. And that's a, that's a big deal when you're trying to put worship service together and that kind of thing. But uh, we wish him lots, lots of uh, luck, him and his new bride, and, uh, and, and we will miss you all. But, of course, you'll always be a part of us. You're just, you'll just be missionaries uh, you know, going on the, the way. We have a few announcements. Uh, Brother Hill, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but who is excited? That's that is that is exciting. That uh, uh, I come in contact. I work work with a guy. I come in contact daily, and him telling me how he can prove that the Bible is not right, and he has, and uh, you know, and, and things, and uh, uh, very exciting. I'm looking forward to this week to to what we're going to get to get to learn. I have just a few announcements to make uh, before. Uh, before we're going into our next part of our service. Sympathy is extended to Frank Forrest and his family and the death of his mother, Merle Forrest, on Thursday. Uh, the arrangements are completed this time. Visitation will be at the Harpeth Hills Funeral Home on Highway 100 on Monday from 4 to 8, and the services will be conducted on Tuesday at 10 o'clock with visitation beginning at 9, and the burial will follow at 11. Uh, let's be sure to keep uh, Frank is here this morning, him and his family uh, in our prayers as, uh, in, in the loss of his mother. Uh, also, Joyce Crawford, we're glad to announce, is now at home uh, from rehab and is doing well. So she is recovering and on her way to getting better and hopefully being back with us. If you look in the bulletin, we have quite a few th events coming up. Uh, of course, VBS, we're thinking about that. Uh, we'll make sure we announce this, and Jeff's got a huge announcement after I get finished up here to come and tell us about BBS. We're going to uh, have a uh, have a video, a quick video to show. So if uh, if uh, if you don't have to go, if you will remain uh, seated after this, Jeff's going to come up here and tell us all about BBS. He's going to tell us this also, but I'm going to tell us right now too. Services tonight will start at 6:30, not at 5 o'clock. So. If you get here at five, somebody will be here and we'll be glad to see you, but services will start at 6.30 tonight and, and we'll run until 8.30 and that'll be the same uh, all through all through Wednesday night, through through the week. Uh, today, Josh will, uh, uh, and, and and his group will be uh, going to Brookdale Bell Mead to conduct services for the uh, uh, people there at uh, four o'clock. Uh, July 13th, Shower of the People, our ladies virtual book study will be July 15th. I'm just going to run down these real quick. Uh, next Sunday night, we'll have a song service at 5 o'clock. Uh, upcoming elders and deacons meet, congregational meeting August 1st uh, at 2 o'clock, so be, be uh, watching for that. Uh, Monday night for the master, August 2nd, and ladies be uh, getting ready for the wedding shower for Caitlin Himes, which is scheduled on the 8th uh, at 1 o'clock here at the building. Uh, I think we announced this last week. I want to be sure to congratulate Brooklyn Beatty, who was baptized into Christ at church camp last week. We're proud of Brooklyn, and I'm, I hope we've all told her that. And uh, uh, I deliver Brooklyn's mail, so I know a lot of people sent her cards and stuff this week, and and uh, and uh, so that that is very good. Wedding invitation: Mr. and Mrs. Ken Reed request the honor of your presence at the marriage of their daughter Kayla Michelle to Austin Stephen, son of. Mr. and Mrs. Steve Bishop on Saturday, July the 17th at 2 p.m. at the Concord Road Church of Christ uh, reception to follow. And it's got a website down there that uh, where you can reply for, at that. Uh, I think that's all I've got this morning. Uh, like I say, when, after we do our closing prayer, if you will remain seated, Jeff's going to come up here and, and tell us all about uh, VBS, give us, give us some instructions for Sunday school. Uh, and uh, if you will bow with me, we will have our closing prayer at this time. Most high and holy God, we're so thankful for this day and the blessings you've given us. Father, we're excited here at Charlotte Heights that our BBS is starting. Father, so many people have worked hard on this, and we're, we're so thankful for that. Father, the, the coming together that we have during BBS time and, and working together and, and, and everybody going after the same cause, Father, it's very encouraging. And Father, we pray that we will do that year round and, and, and keep that same kind of enthusiasm. Father, we appreciate uh, Brother Hill being here this morning. We, we're th so thankful for the, the work that he has done and his colleagues have done and the proof that 
that your scriptures are real, Father. We know that, but Father, there's so many in the world that, that are skeptical about that. And Father, we're so thankful that that uh, we have information that we can take and, and use to teach. Father, I ask you to be with uh, Austin and Kayla, Father, as they start their new life together. Father, we pray that that you will bless them as they as they will still be a part of your kingdom and worship in their new home, Father, and we, we're so thankful for them. Father, we're saddened at the death of Merle Forrest, and Father, we ask you to be with Frank and his family. Father, we ask that you would comfort them. Father, I know that, that they will look to you for comfort and look to your words for comfort, and Father, please help us to do our part in that comfort also. Father, again, bless us as we as we dismiss from here and, and go to our Sunday school class, our Sunday school thing that we're doing today. Please keep us safe till we return again. It's in Jesus, your son's name we pray. Amen.